Right now, people know you as a sports personality, but what do you want them to know you as personally? Personally, I would like for people to know me as a real ass bitch, <laughs> like you do. <laughs> I do. <laughs> no, but no, really though, I, I have a lot to say. I have a lot of thoughts. I think we both do. And, you know, we respect the businesses that we work in that everyone doesn't necessarily come to us for our thoughts on everything else. And so they don't really get to see our personalities and what we care about, what we're passionate about all the time. So I want people to get to know me in a very personal way. And you? I, I think that I have not been given the space to be seen as a complex person. I think people see me as one thing and it's hard for them to see me as anything outside of that, like a full human. Like people say, okay, she's this, she's this, she's this, but never all these things at once. So I think I want this show to show people that you can be all the things that you are. And like being a sports journalist doesn't mean the only thing that you care about is basketball and football. You still care about the people you love. You care about your family. You have hobbies. You read books. You watch television shows. You, you have thoughts about everything that everyone else has thoughts about. So I just think I want it to be a chance to show everyone who I am holistically and not just who you see on shows. I'm Taylor Rooks. And I'm Joy Taylor. And we are about to get personal. So I wrote some questions for Joy. I wrote some questions for Taylor. What's she about to ask me? Well, because we have not seen them. I'm going to ask you. <laughs> <laughs> no. But what, what kind of vibe? I'm going to expose you. No. <laughs> they're, they're very personal questions. OK. We have not seen these or talked about them at all. So OK, gonna, I trust you. We're going to get personal. Cheers. That was very personal. <laughs> that was so awkward. Cheers. Cheers, mate. <laughs> How have your romantic relationships shaped the way that you define love? Jesus. Um, <laughs> well, I, I mean, I've been in some very good relationships, some very positive, healthy relationships, and I've been in some pretty horrific relationships. And any range from when I first started dating, whatever, in high school until now, I think I have a different version of love today than I did when I was, you know, 17 or 18, obviously. But it's taken me getting over those romantic relationships to finding love to get to the point I am now. But also, you know, how you grow up teaches you what love is. Mm -hmm. So I grew up in a very abusive home. So my identity, like, what I identified as love was not, not even love. It was just like terror. So you have to get over that and then figure out whatever high school love is and then college love and then adult love and then whatever it is now. So it's definitely shaped how I looked at love until I went to therapy. Which everyone should go to therapy, <laughs> just FYI. <laughs> and it's a process. Yeah. <laughs> we define a lot of love based on like what we see in TV mm -hmm. or what we see on movies or what we see on social media. Like, oh, this is what love is. When really mostly it's fake. And also that's just what love is to them. And like what love is to you is very individualistic. So I really had to sit and think what makes me feel loved and appreciated. And through relationships, especially the one I'm in now, I know that literally love is just somebody seeing you. And I don't know if I'd ever seen fully seen until this moment. And I have been with people that have cheated on me like it was an Olympic sport. <laughs> um, I have been with really, really good guys that did nothing wrong to me, but I understood that like, just because somebody is nice does not mean they're the person for you. Right. I have been in things that like I thought they were the one for me, but it was because it was built on a passion that was sometimes unhealthy. And now I know that like love is calm. When was the first time you ever felt pretty? Aww. Been a bad bitch since 1992. <laughs> <laughs> to be real. No, the first time I ever felt pretty. I mean, honestly, growing up every single day, my parents would say, like, you're beautiful. Like, they would reinforce that to me all the time. But maybe I personally felt pretty for the first time, like, um, like at prom. Like, I felt like I had my dress, I had my makeup. I'm like, this is what it is like to be pretty. I remember that. So maybe I'd say prom. But I also kind of don't have an answer because I think I have always been like... <laughs> 
Do you see it? Odd's favorite. It's not her fault. Yeah. (laughs) Follow up with him or whoever you believe in. What about you? (laughs) Um, The first time I felt pretty, I have a picture of it. It's, um, I I was really young. I was probably like 12 or something. And we would always play dress up, me and my younger sister. And I I was a huge tomboy, um, but I was also simultaneously always a girly girl. And so I love makeup. I don't know about you, but I was never allowed to wear makeup until Same. I was in high school. So well, outside of like, you know, special occasions. But I like we like did our makeup and I did my little hair with my curls. And I like took this picture on a Polaroid camera that I that I have somewhere. I posted it before, but I it was like that moment when you're kind of becoming a preteen and you're yeah. like, oh, wait a minute. I'm cute. I'm actually cute. <laughs> okay. Have you ever read a negative comment about yourself on the internet that actually hurt your feelings or affected you? What was it and how did you deal with the emotions from that? Um, no. No. (laughs) (laughs) Fuck the internet. I mean, that (laughs) ass though, I don't care what the internet says. Yeah. And I I mean this, this, like, I can't say that the internet has never hurt my feelings. That's not true. But to say, like, one comment or, like, one opinion that the internet has or, like, something that I see often, no. Like, I've I've been on air for, in some version for, like, I don't know, since 2007. So there's been plenty of feedback. And I've, you know, I was super young then and I was in college and now I'm 37 and I've gained weight and lost weight and looked different and looked older and looked younger, like had my hair different, whatever. So everyone has an opinion about like your looks or what you do for a living or what you say or how your voice sounds. I just, I just don't fucking care. I don't care. And the reason I don't care is because one, I know people would never say this to my face because I've been in the business for that long and no one has ever done it. Mm -hmm. I have one memory of one person ever saying something to my face. And I remember it because he's the only person that's ever said it. And he's just, he said he loves the show. He just doesn't like the sound of my voice. I'll take it. (laughs) I don't know. What am I? I can't change my voice. There's nothing I can do about that. And you still listen. So, you know, cool. It's like a backhanded compliment. So, no, I can't, I cannot say that anything. I'm sorry to disappoint everyone, but I just can't. We do not care about the no photo and the profile pic and you just deciding to talk about us. Even if you do, it's just. I think people are entitled to their opinions, first of all, because I have an opinion. You're allowed to have an opinion. I don't want to be for everyone. I consider it a privilege if you don't like me, because that means that I'm saying something that is influential. Everyone should not agree with you all the time. And I think we're in a kind of a space where it's like, if someone disagrees with you, they're a hater. And it's like, no. Yeah. We disagree on shit. Yeah. Why why do we have to always agree on everything? Who fucking cares? Who wants that experience? So today the internet likes me. I feel great. Tomorrow they don't. I feel terrible. I, I'm very busy, as you know. Yeah. Um, was there anything that anyone's ever said about you on the internet that's hurt your feelings? Well, I, I'm in about 100 different relationships, well, for yeah, sure, yeah, for online. Sure. You get busy, girl. Yeah, I am. Oh, <laughs> don't make me take your man. Um, <laughs> no, I mean, I... Nothing that has ever bothered me, I'd say. But there was this moment on the internet where a lot of people were trying to say that I got a nose job, that I had like light into my skin, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And that did make me really upset only because something that is incredibly important to me is you seeing me as black as fuck. Like I need every person to know like, she embraces what she is. Like my nose is a part of my look. I have no desire to make it more European, to make it skinnier, to make it smaller. I have no desire to make my skin lighter. I have no desire to look anything other than what I look like. And something that will happen online sometimes, whenever I do anything, if I post like a photo or whatever, people will try to say, she's so pretty. Like, what is she mixed with? Or, oh, she has like very... Eurocentric features, which number one, no, I don't. Like, <laughs> there is everything about me is very monoracially black. Both of my parents are black. All of my grandparents are black. And I just, it's very important to me that when somebody is talking about me, they talk about the fact that I am black and they don't attribute it to anything else. So that it is very bothersome to me when anybody tries to put things on me that I am not. I always want to feel 
accessible to other black people. I want to feel incredibly relatable to other black people. And also I want them to know that there's nothing that you have to change about yourself because I am in this space and I look like a black girl. Like I look like your neighbor from down the street. I look like someone you grew up with, but I understand the pressures of feeling like you do have to change who you are because this space does make you feel that way. So I've never done anything. I have no desire to ever do anything and I am as black as they come. <laughs> one of the best parts of our friendship is how we instinctively trust one another. How much do you value having a secret keeper? And when did you know that we could trust one another? I'm trying to think of like, <laughs> we've been in some pretty funny <laughs> situations so like trying to think of- But I, we're not gonna say no, because we trust each other. <laughs> yeah, not yet. Like, I'm sure you're thinking of the same ones. So I don't know, when did you know you could trust me? Well, I think we had a moment that I'm not going to say on camera, <laughs> but that okay. you were very upset about. Okay. Because of what somebody had done. Um, and that was a moment. But I think that it's more that we, un we understand each other. I know other. exactly <laughs> what you're talking about. <laughs> that shit made me fucking crazy. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. No, that, 100%. That for sure is when I was Oh my God, like, I was so oh, fucking mad. Yes, absolutely. And you should have been. Let's be very clear, you should have been. <laughs> but beyond that, what I realized after that moment that we will never speak of <laughs> is that you and I both professionally and personally understand that the space that we hold is unique. Yeah. So I know what is at stake for you the same way that you know what's at stake for me. And there's very few people, like there's just women generally that will not relate to what you and I have to go through every day. Right. But we relate to one another because we're going through the exact same thing. Like we are women, we are in a male dominated space. People always have something to say about us. They maybe only see us as one thing. They take our voices away because they're only seeing us what we look like. Like all of these things that we get dragged into that we don't want to be dragged into. And that is a incredibly singular, unique experience. So the fact that there is somebody out there that I can talk to you about things that I don't have to over explain because it is baked into the fabric of your everyday yeah. just makes me trust you because you get it without me having to tell you and tell you and tell you. And so it's important to me and special to me that I have you in the space. I love you. Oh, love you and too. I was so fucking mad. Oh my God. <laughs> yeah. so like, I was like, I don't know how else to explain this moment. No, I, I forgot know. about that, honestly, because I, I couldn't, I had to move on <laughs> so people could live. Ciao. Um, okay. Discuss a time you lost faith in a loved one or you gained trem tremendous faith in them. Mm, that's a great question. Lost faith in a loved one or gained tremendous faith? Dealer's choice. Yeah. So my mom and I are really, really close. We've always been close. Um, recently in therapy though, we've been talking a lot about my mom and about our relationship and how sometimes it's very hard for me to show my emotions because growing up, I didn't always see emotions. I feel like I'm gonna cry now because I'm thinking about the conversation, but I told my therapist that I wanted to talk to my mom about this because I can't remember times that like, I even saw my mom be emotional. And I in turn am not very emotional. Even though I'm crying right now, I'm not a crier. Like this I- why the therapy is yeah. working. Um, and so I said to my mom, I'm like, you know, in therapy, we've been talking a lot about the fact that like, I never, I never feel sad. I kind of work on autopilot a lot of the times. And I just said like, why do you feel like maybe that is? And she is just talking to me about how I was growing up and the things that she had to deal with when I was growing up. And that sometimes it was hard for her because she was feeling like she was in turmoil with things with her personally. And so she didn't always even have the capacity to show emotion. She just wanted to be like this steady hand. So I'm more picking somebody that I gained such tremendous faith in my mom and having that conversation because going into it, I was really nervous because that's just not a thing that we discuss. Mm -hmm. So to be able to have that moment of like, I see you and I understand why you view the world the way you do because it's also how I view the world. I think it was, it was therapeutic for both of us. And it also continued to make me more in tune with like how I feel about 
things that happen around me. Because I don't think up until this point, genuinely, like up until I turned 31, I started to think about how I feel and not just like what I'm doing. And funny enough, actually, like a week ago, um, I was at a dinner. He was telling me about an interview that he watched where the guy says, before I turned 31, I never cried. And now I turn 31 and I cry every day. And that's how I feel a lot of the time. And I'm, it's sad that like both for me and even for my mom, I just think we didn't give our space or give ourselves space to cry or to be sad. I don't know what it is like to be sad. And so I'm now trying to like further embrace like what that, um, what that emotion feels like. And I'm not sad right now. <laughs> <laughs> I'm actually really happy, but it's, um, it makes me cry to think about that moment with my mom and that it took me to be 31 to like have that kind of moment with her. So that's what I'd say. Oh. <laughs> I'm not gonna make you cry more because I hate when people do that. <laughs> um, that's great. Yeah. I like that you picked the Tremendous Faith one. Do you believe in pretty privilege? Mm. If so, what are the misconceptions about it? Oh, this is a whole episode or four. <laughs> um, 